Well, great to have Ed Chauncey and Michael Lowe here today. Uh, Ed Chauncey, University of Chicago, Michael Lowe, of course, of Cambridge here. Um, Ed's visit to Cambridge prompted me to uh, <clears throat> think it might be an idea <clears throat> to have a bit of a conversation about the compilation of the Cambridge history of ancient China. You know, that sort of uh, 1,000 plus tom volume that is now about 15 years old. Yeah. And that in many ways you know, set the standard as a reference work you know, in the field of early China studies, not just for scholars in the field, but also for graduate students and people interested in the ancient world beyond you know, the group of, 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 of sinologists. And um, I thought it would be a nice opportunity to sort of uh, <coughs> See whether we can uh, recall how this all came together, um, how the process of bringing this book together was experienced by both of you, and uh, how editing and co-editing, huh. herding a flock of scholars to <laughs> one direction or the other, how that worked out. Um, before we get to the actual, the volume itself, uh, how did how did you two? both meet? When, where did you meet each other for the first time professionally? We may get different answers yeah. to this from <laughs> both of us, but do you remember, Michael? Yes. 1990, I was teaching in Harvard, came over to Chicago at Ed Schultz's invitation for Thanksgiving, and met you then. University of Chicago closed for Thanksgiving Day itself, but not the next day. You and I had a cup of coffee in... I could go to the place now if it's still left. I can't remember its name. Does that concur with, with you? Um, perhaps. Uh, a little bit. You, you forgot having met me as a very young man. Yes. Uh, 1983. We were, we were at a conference together in Berkeley. 79. No, 79, I, I showed up at that conference only very briefly and didn't, didn't meet anyone. But in 1983, Jeff Regal had a conference on divination. Um, and I was, I was officially uh, sort of allowed to present a paper. And, uh, and you and I talked at the time because I had done a master's translation for Stanford University on uh, Shiji 128, the Quetzalcoatl, in which you were interested. And I gave it to you at the time and we talked about it. But, uh, but then we didn't, we didn't have anything more, mm -hmm. um, any more contact until 1990, you're right. And I would swear I remember seeing you and hearing you make comments at that 79 conference in Berkeley on Mao Andre manuscripts, uh, not taking part, but I'm sure I remember seeing you then. Uh, I, I don't think I would have yeah. made any comments, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I showed up for one day. That's it. Conference, yeah. So Michael, that would have been about the period that you had, you were in the process of doing Cambridge History of China, Volume 1, that oh, you know, or that was finished, or that was well, ongoing at the time? That's good. You know the whole story of the Cambridge History series from 1960s onwards, um, conceived by Tritches mm -hmm. and Fairbank to be five, six volumes. Yes, we each wrote a chapter for a work of that size. Yes, obviously it grew and grew. Eventually, Dennis said to me, no, you were going to have a whole volume on how would I act as co-editor with him. I suppose this was sometime in the late 60s, mm -hmm. about 1970. Mm -hmm. So we tore up what we'd written. Right. the first go, right. and um, I suppose we were working on volume one in the 70s, we were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by the time 
By the time the Cambridge History of Ancient China, the volume naught, was conceived, we are we are roughly about twenty years after volume one, and we are following spoke Mao and Clay is already. Volume one was well, out. Vol Vol one was conceived about nineteen seventy. Right. But it was a, a long parturition, as they say. Mm -hmm. I think it was published formally in eighty seven or eighty four. Mm -hmm. That that early. Eighty four? Yeah. I'm pretty we well, could pull it off the shelf, yeah, um, but the review. So Michael, Michael's right that he uh, he came to Chicago in 1990, mm -hmm. and uh, and my colleague Tony Yu, uh, yeah, somehow uh, I was I was chair of the department at the time, uh, but very young. I was the junior member of the mm -hmm. department and didn't feel like I could propose mm -hmm. things. And I was very surprised at a faculty meeting that uh, um, Tony said, oh, well, Michael Lowy has just retired from Cambridge and did a visiting stint at Harvard. Why don't we invite him to Chicago? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, was, I was happy to endorse mm -hmm. that, and we did. And you came, I think, in the fall of 1991. You're right. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, you were there just for one term, the fall term of uh, so September through December. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember one night we were going out to have dinner at the what's called the Quadrangle Club in Chicago, and uh, it's the faculty club, and, and we were we were having a whiskey together. And Michael was lamenting some of the first reviews mm -hmm. of Cambridge History Vol. 1 that had just been appearing and pointing out the great flaw in this whole series mm -hmm. that they had left everything before Chin and Han out. How could you start Chinese history mm -hmm. without at least yeah, that's the, right. the, yes. the Shang mm -hmm. and the Zhou? Mm -hmm. um, I of course agreed with uh, with the reviewers that it was it was really pretty stupid, yeah. um, and he said, "Well, um, you know, we should remedy this. Uh, would you would you Ed be willing to uh, to help out mm -hmm. if I were to undertake with Cambridge University Press to to edit a uh, a, de a volume dedicated to this? Mm -hmm. Is that your memory at all?" Oh, this happened, I think, after the second Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, all right, let me just comment on that one. Of course, planning Cambridge history in the 1960s, they were quite right at that time. They couldn't conceivably have produced a volume. Yeah. Yeah. The feel wasn't, I mean, it wasn't yeah. simply. But by then, by then, it had become there just. Yeah. Conceivably possible. So at what point, I mean, you, you started to sort of think of people, potential contributors sort of in the early 90s after, after those meetings and... Well, when Michael said that uh, would I be willing to help him, I thought all that meant was to answer the telephone every once in a while <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and provide my... But this is back, back before the days of email. Um, yeah. And we used to call back and forth, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, then Michael went back to England, and uh, within about three or four months, he produced this proposal for Cambridge mm -hmm. University Press, and I was shocked, shocked, on the first page that there was proposed co-editors, right. Michael Lowy and Ed Shaughnessy, <laughs> and I, I thought that was more than I had bargained for. But, yeah. uh, um, I think that was, would have been about 1992. Mm -hmm. And we kept talking through letters back and right. forth about, about the, the scope, um, about potential contributors, so it was a, a kind of dialectical process that the availability of contributors mm -hmm. uh, influenced the scope of the, the volume and yeah. the scope influenced who yeah. we could invite. Um, when we 
were you a hero as a visiting fellow? No. When, so, as a visiting fellow was 96, when we were working on the editing. Right, right. Okay. But I came in 93. Yes. For a conference at St. John's. That it's the ritual. Ritual. And the, the ritual conference. It and uh, Joe Bookdelmo. I remember that. That was, yeah. that was yeah. my first yeah. year. Yeah. And yeah. that's, and we, we really kind of finalized at yeah. that time okay. who, who we would be inviting mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at that conference, there were several contributors. Uh, Jessica Rawson, uh, Mark Lewis, Dave. No, David didn't no. write for us, but I think they were both there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wasn't in a sense, I mean, you sort of, I mean, the 90s is that period where on the one hand, of course, you you still have an eminent representation of very senior scholars, uh, and you have a sort of a new generation of younger ones and mid-career scholars who were working on early China. And uh, if we just look at the spread of people who you approached. I mean, there was a good mixture of, of that was both in there. You, 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 that was intentional. Right. We really, of course, the senior scholars. The the first thing that we agreed was that Casey Jung mm -hmm. should be right. should be represented in the volume, right. even though he was no longer interested in in Shang civilization, mm -hmm. uh, but just because of his. his position in the field. And right. his first reaction was no. Right. Then it so happened I was in Beijing, or was it Taipei, taking flights back here. There was a KC and uh, somehow we got into the business lounge and uh, we started talking about it. He said, well, you made me change my mind and he agreed to do it. But, uh, that was, I suppose. Yes. Of course, he, he, he was already suffering from Parkinson's yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, but that, so, so the, the mix of senior and mid career right. or junior scholars was, was really intentional. Okay. We wanted that. Yeah. The other thing that we, we decided on from the outset was that we wanted to do two chapters for each yeah. period. We wanted to stress the, the historical side based on, mm -hmm. um, on literary materials and the artifactual side. Right. side. So each, yeah. one of, each one of those four core mm -hmm. chapters had two contributors. Mm -hmm. and, and did you, I, I assume with all edited volumes there are certain, Sorry. with all edited volumes there are certain topics you know, that stand out as the ones that obviously need to be included, and for which you have very clear candidates, you know, who will be able to write, you know, to, to, to write the text. And there are other topics for which either, well, which require more negotiation in terms of the concept of a book, or and or might be more difficult to, to populate, you know, with authors. And in your introduction, you are you are very clear about this. You're saying, well, there are certain topics uh, that we we have not included, not been able to include. Well, for, for example, um, here we are sitting here, science and technology, sure. no, yeah. not for us in that volume, yeah. it was yeah. being handled somewhere else mm -hmm. and uh, it was the right thing to do. Right. Uh, economics, we didn't particularly have any inclination to look right. at. Exactly. Mark, Mark touches on uh, economic yeah. theory. And touches on yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the... Uh, the structure of the book, in some ways, was natural in that we, we followed a traditional Chinese um, period, so Shang, Western Zhou, Spring and Autumn, mm -hmm. Warring States, and that took up the, the eight chapters that we regarded as the core of the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In terms of, of how, to, how, how to arrange that, I think the, the traditional history side was pretty straightforward, as well, David Keatley had to do Oracle Bones. Yeah. Um, I remember one of the one of the referees that Cambridge University Press got said, "Well, it's crazy that you should have Shaughnessy do the Western Joe. It really should be Xu Zhuoyun 
right. who does this, because he mm -hmm. had just published this book on Western Joe history. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, but since I was since I was co-editor, I had to yeah. write something, and yeah. uh, um, and that was the only thing I was equipped to do. And um, so actually, you to do the yeah. yeah, and that of course was what he had done his uh, yeah his PhD mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And then Mark on the uh, uh, in terms of the archaeologist, it was clear that Jessica would do the Western Joe. She mm -hmm. had just published that big yeah. two-volume Sackler thing, and Bob Bagley had published also the Sackler thing on the Shaw. Mm -hmm. So that made sense. Mm -hmm. Wu Hong had just joined the faculty at Chicago, so we right. clearly wanted to include him. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, and he said, "Well." Uh, war, uh, he could do the Warring States. He mm -hmm. was interested in that. Mm -hmm. That's right. That left just one chapter right. remaining, mm -hmm. and we wanted to include Lotar, mm -hmm. but he was very angry with us. Why do I get the leftovers? <laughs> <laughs> the, the most interesting periods are either the Western Joe or the Warring States, and you stick me in the middle with this boring spring <laughs> on. <laughs> But he, he did it. He okay. did a good job. Right. He did indeed, yes. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, you have 14 in total. 14 in total. chapters. You know, nearly as many, well, uh, nearly as many contributors. Uh, but the, yeah, all. the risk with these types of volumes is always that there is such a time lapse between the moment it is conceived, the yeah. moment the papers are being produced, <coughs> yes. and the point in time at which you've edited them. And you know, the time, the point at which the book actually appears, you know, is on the bookshelf. And how did you manage the timeline of this from the moment that you approached people? I think we were pretty smart and clever the way we did it. And the time lag between writing and publication, well, it was longer than it should be, not through our fault. Things were happening in Cambridge Press, and this was Cambridge Press New York, yeah. not Cambridge yeah. Press Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I think there was eight to nine months when we simply got no communication from them. Right. And they changed their editorial staff in mm -hmm. the middle, mm -hmm. so that the, by the time we were really in the thick of seeing proofs and that sort of thing, the people working on it there had not read the earlier correspondence. Sure. Okay. And, uh, but no, um, I think we did it in four or five years. Yeah. We, uh, we got the uh, initial approval from CUP right. in 1994. And yeah. we, right. held, we held that conference. So that's when we, we had already come up with the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the final listing of contributors. And uh, the 14 of them. The, the, those those other chapters fell into place in some in some ways by coincidence, mm -hmm. um, you know. Just as we had had agreed early on that Casey Jong had to be represented, um, we also uh, just by chance both of us knew and liked Nicola Di Cosmo right. and said. We want Nicola to be involved mm -hmm. in this, and and we we asked him to expand the scope of his PhD mm -hmm. dissertation to include the earlier period, which mm -hmm. he did, and eventually resulted in that that other book that he yeah. uh, that he did, yeah. um, and, and some of the other chapters were more natural, Bill mm -hmm. Holtz on language, yeah. the Don Harper and yeah. uh, David Nipson yeah. you know, doing doing thought, mm -hmm. all of that made good sense. But um, in 1994, in I believe late October or November, we brought almost all of the contributors to Chicago. Oh, I see. Uh, we had a meeting uh, out in a, a state park, mm -hmm. two hours outside of Chicago. And we did that intentionally because we didn't want people in downtown Chicago saying, oh, tonight I'm going to go to the, the yeah. symphony or yeah. I'm going to took them out yeah. in this place in the middle of nowhere, actually quite a nice park, but uh, yeah. starved rock. Okay. And uh, we invited also Li Xue Qin 
to come I see. and be a kind of general interlocutor. Uh -huh. uh, and we had graduate students. We, uh, we had graduate students come. Yeah. Um, and uh, 12 of the 14 contributors. Uh, Casey couldn't come and Shudrian couldn't come. That's right. They yeah. were the two missing uh, ones. And we that was at the point when the, 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 the first drafts were had been written. They hadn't been written yet. What we had asked people to do was to come up with very brief sort of threads mm -hmm. that they were going to that they were going to follow. Because the contracts had only been let four or five months before that. Right. Right. Uh, and there were there were generally congenial discussions, sometimes a little bit uh, antagonistic, but... Uh, On the whole, they went very well indeed. Mm -hmm. And um, this was preparatory. We wanted to make sure people were not going to overlap too much. Yeah. It was, so you had to have some overlap, but so that everybody knew yeah. pretty well what the approach was going to be by their colleagues. Yeah. That's what we wanted. We wanted them to hear what each other were doing so that right. they could then go back and write their chapters. Mm -hmm. We spent probably about two-thirds of the time uh, with each person presenting how, how he thought that they should go forward, mm -hmm. and, and people responding. Yeah. Um, and then a third of the time, the last day, we had a real nuts and bolts yes, session right. on conventions, mm -hmm. what we were going to do, how we were going to translate terms and titles and so forth. That was the most contentious day, uh, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, at the end, one of the things that both of us stressed was that we had to move this thing quickly. Mm -hmm. When you deal with archaeology, if, if you let it drift, there's going to be a new discovery that's going to call them. And, and then Michael, Michael always, uh, always used these military metaphors that the fleet moves at the speed of the slowest ship. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that one contributor yeah. could bog the whole thing down. Yeah. So we took turns playing good cop, bad cop right. with the contributors mm -hmm. that just trying to, yeah. as you say, sort of herd cats. Uh, now, I don't remember, your memory is much better than mine is, I don't remember any really outstanding delays from contributors. Mm. Yeah. It, um, and of course we're talking about a pre-email age, yeah. uh, and of course printing and all that was in a Different stage from yeah. now, I yeah. say. But we got we got the first. We asked people. So this was in late 1994 mm -hmm. that we had this preparatory meeting, and we gave people one year. And we said that I was arranging to come here to Cambridge mm -hmm. in yeah, January of '96. Yeah, and that you know I was going to spend three months here. And that that was the period that Michael and I would have together mm -hmm. to go over and edit things. And so we really, really underscored for the contributors that if you don't get your materials in by then, we yeah. miss that chance. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was fixed. Most of the people got, got their chapters in. Um, if, you, if you sort of look back on that preparatory period, uh, what were the, I mean, other than technicalities of obviously translation and convention and, 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 and of course referencing and so on, in terms of intellectual approaches, in terms of, you know, the kind of take that scholars, various disciplines, various generations had on that topic, do you, do you sort of, do you remember, or were there any outstanding kind of intellectual issues, intellectual debates that you recall from those discussions? You're talking about differences of attitude between different countries. Between different countries. I mean, I can imagine 
I can imagine things like that. You know, obviously, there are people who problematize the use of the word China these days. And then, so well, how far do you go when you're trying to sort of get people together? I don't remember any primary grave difficulties you do. Well, I, I do. Um, and one that recurred later in um, the, the one really important book review that came mm -hmm. out on the book. But this was when we were at Star Rock. And I, I remember that Bob Bagley gave a, uh, uh, an analogy that uh, here we are. Can you imagine that we're all here, and we're all at a, a party, and we only have an audio recording of the party. And this is what you folks who deal with textual materials are making use of and you don't know and you're trying to yeah. reconstruct what the party was like mm -hmm. just on the basis of this audio recording mm -hmm. that uh, is completely disembodied. Yeah. Um, I responded, imagine if we only had a video recording without any sound mm -hmm. and we could see um, uh, King Wen and the Duke of Zhou talking to yeah. each other but have no clue as to what they said. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't wouldn't we want to have that as well? Um, and and that was that was the tension mm -hmm. between yep. the archaeologists and yeah. the, the text people. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, and we got the same sort of story from Jessica, who pretty well openly said, of course, there's no earthly body using. And this material is all prejudiced, whereas the the archaeological records state such and such in letters of yeah. purple yeah. and gold. It, uh, so in essence, I mean, it's a, a debate that's continuing. Yeah, it's yeah. a debate, and yes. and Bob, I think, put the put the debate. You know, he raised it, and mm -hmm. he, he put it um, in in sharp focus, yeah. and uh, um, and I I can appreciate both sides mm -hmm. of that. And, and yes, that debate continues. You know, there, there was this review of the book, a very lengthy review by David Skoberg, yeah. um, in which he, he took the side of the, the archaeologist mm -hmm. and uh, took, took the, the text people to task, mm -hmm. um, with the exception of David Keeley. Uh, um, yeah, that debate continues. Uh, so that was, I think, the one. Mm -hmm. The one major kind of philosophical right. debate. Yeah. Yes. 